I will begin by telling you about a few conceptual puzzles. And these puzzles, in my view, in my opinion, motivate a broadly idealist approach, or idealist worldview in some sense. Now, what I mean by that specifically here is a view that starts with some sort of notion of first-person perspective, and not with the world in some sense. So the second part will give you an attempt to do so. It's not a complete theory, it's like a toy model or first simple approach, how you might try such a thing, but it has some quite fun um, things that it can already say. So it's an approach in which observers are fundamental in some sense, and we can prove that some sort of notion of an external world emerges in some sense. Also in the third part, um, there will be, I will show you that you can have something like objective reality, not as something that you assume from the beginning, but as something that you can prove as a theorem, as like a statistical long-term consequence of some assumptions that you make. Um, also, there will be some fun surprises in the end, something like probabilistic zombies, for example. So we heard of zombies before. Um, I'm not talking about those. I'm actually not talking about consciousness at all here even though I'm in the consciousness session. So these will be some sort of information theoretic version of zombies in some sense. Okay, so let me go to the first part. So what do I mean by these puzzles? So here's one puzzle, a Parfit's teletransportation paradox. Um, now what is it all about? Well, imagine you're Alice the guinea pig <laughs> and you live on Earth and you wanna actually travel to Mars. Um, but you don't do it in the usual way, like you board your airplane or so, but you have a teletransporter. Yeah? So this is something you know from science fiction. It's a machine that basically scans you to all detail and destroys your body by doing so and sends the data to Mars. And then there will be another copy of you just recreated there and instantly you're at Mars. All right, now what Parfit looked at was the case where the transporter is broken. So suppose the transporter is broken and something that you don't really want to happen actually happens. So you have your copy on Mars, so you travel on Mars in the way you would but there's another copy remaining on Earth somehow. Yeah. And so the question that Parfit discusses in this context is like, is it still the same person or so? Now, I do not want to discuss this question. I don't think it's a fruitful question, but this might be a more fruitful question. So suppose you're actually Alice the guinea pig here, and you know the transporter is broken, and it's 15 minutes before you're supposed to board it. Let me ask, hmm, what does it mean to me? What will happen to me next? Will I be on Earth or will I wake up on Mars somehow? So perhaps you would want to assign some probability or such a thing uh, and to guess what happens to you next. Uh, now there's a second version of that, a uh, structurally similar puzzle that appeared actually in physics. And this is a Boltzmann brain problem. And I again just give you a poor man's version of that, a very colorful version. Uh, again, so suppose that the universe is very large. So assume some cosmological model where because it's actually combinatorially large, there will be really many fluctuations happening. And so fluctuations means the following. So you're here, you're the, the observer, and you know there's this, this big universe out there. And you know due to the sheer size of the universe and fluctuations from quantum mechanics, thermodynamics, that there are actually sometimes fluctuations that think that are you. So this is fluctuations that are called Boltzmann brains. Think of a brain just popping up, yeah, thinking they've been on Earth all along, or they're sitting here in the audience and listening to this talk, where actually they've just fluctuated into, into existence. And then the next moment, they will see, oh, something's wrong, what the hell is going on? And then they may disappear, okay? Again, that's a poor man's version of that paradox. But if that's the case, then you may ask, well, hmm, you might be worried. Are you actually one of them? Or what should you think that you will see next? Could you assign a probability to making this strange observation, yes or no? And now some cosmologists would say this is actually interesting because it can assign a probability to this, and we don't see that. Maybe that is a way to actually rule out some cosmological models or so. So as you'll see, these are two puzzles about this specific first-person question, what will I see next? And they both fall into some kind of exotic regime. And in this exotic regime, another question, for example, that you could consider of the same kind would be, um, what if I simulate an agent on a computer? Yeah. I promise to simulate you tomorrow. Will this be of relevance to what you actually will see? There's also the hard problem of consciousness. I will not say much about this. Um, but certainly this question here, yeah, what will I see next, also appears in more mundane situations. So laboratory experiments, for example. Yeah. Here, suppose you build this optical table and you press your button 
And then you ask, oh, will I actually hear the detector click? And now this is a regime, and also astronomical observations would be a regime, where we think, well, this is where physics applies. Uh, I can certainly ask physics and compute the probability that I hear a detector click, whereas in the other regime, I would say, well, probably it's the philosophy of mind or something like that. I have to, to use different methodology to say anything about these uh, situations. But as you realize here, this Boltzmann rain problem actually appeared in physics. So what this may tell you is that perhaps the boundary is not so clear cut, and it's maybe a fuzzy boundary between these two, these two regions here. Now, um, you may ask, well, what will I see next? Wait a minute. Isn't this, is this really a question that physics is concerned about? Isn't physics concerned about another question? Namely, what is the world like? That's what we typically want to know instead of what will I see next? Well, if you ask, if you look at quantum theory, then you will find that indeed um, what the formulas of quantum theory tells you is the probabilities of outcomes that you will see if you decide to perform a certain measurement. And it's not about what the world is like. And you can actually make this rigorous by looking at Bell's theorem that tells you in some sense it is inconsistent to assume that measurements just always reveal how the world has been like before the measurement, unless you give up other principles like locality. So what I take from that is that even physics in some sense tells us that this first person question of what will I see next is the natural question to ask, or a natural question to ask. Good, now that we have that, where do we go from here? Um, and now the obvious um, attempt or thing you might want to try now when you see this is to say, well, perhaps we can have a unified approach. Can we have an approach? It will say nothing about consciousness, <laughs> so that's a separate question. But perhaps we can have something like a probability, some, some mathematical rule that tells us uniformly in all situations what we see next. And not only in the physics experimental setups, but also in these more exotic regimes. That would be very useful. Um, and Here's, I think, a way how you can do it, or at least try it. The idea would be to, to reverse the standard view that we tend to hold on ourselves in the world. Now, the usual view would be something like this. We have a world, certainly, there's something like the laws of physics that determine its evolution, and somehow we supervene on the world. So if we look at ourselves, say all that I see and all that I remember right now, everything that, that makes up me, whatever that is, then we think that some follows just from the evolution and the state of the physical world. It supervenes on it in some sense. Um, now, for what I'm saying here, I should say that again, I'm not talking about consciousness here or qualia, what does it really feel like to see something or about free will. So when I talk about the state of the observer, then think of some kind of information theoretic description, every information that you locally hold here. Okay, now this is the standard view. But the problem is that this view sometimes doesn't really help us to solve these puzzles that I've talked about. For example, when you ask, oh, in Taylor in Parfit's experiment, will it end up here or there? Then I don't think that any detailed physical knowledge of the, of the mechanism of the transporter will actually be able to answer this question. So then my suggestion is now methodologically to do the following. Suppose that the laws of quote unquote physics, whatever that means, apply directly to the locally available information like the observer state and just get rid for the moment of uh, the idea of a world. Just drop it for now. You know? um, the idea is somehow that, oh yeah, as an observer, you're in some state now, perhaps some whatever that is, perhaps a bit string or so, and then you'll be in another state next, and you have some mathematical quantity, some kind of perhaps probability distribution that tells you the chances of what's happening. Uh, in the following, this will actually be universal induction, and I will talk about that in a slide. You may say, isn't that crazy? I mean, certainly we see all this world around us. It's somewhat crazy to drop that. It's an empirical fact that, um, that we have a physical world in which we're embedded. But as I will try to convince you, we will see that somehow as a theorem, it's a consequence of this approach, you will see that in the long run for observers, it will just so look as if there was some sort of external world around with simple laws that seems to determine what they see. So in a way, it's a reversal of the view and it contains something like a world as, an, as a statistical phenomenon. Thank you. So how could this work? Well, so what's universal induction? I have to say something about what's the probability of an observer's next state given the, the current one. Um, 
And universal induction, the way I mean it here is, for example, Solomonov induction. Now, Solomonov induction, um, many of you will know it, for those who you don't, um, just think, for example, think about a little robot. The robot is just thrown into some unknown environment. It's a probabilistic environment, um, and the probabilities are completely unknown, but there's a promise, namely the probabilities ought to be computable. Now, the task that's given to this robot is, after he has recorded some bits, bit x1, x2, and so on, like 0, 1, 1, 0, the robot should just predict the next bit. But not only the next bit, but actually its probability. It has some unknown probability, mu, that's coming from this environment, and he should predict, the robot should predict it. Now, as Solomonov has proven, there's a way to do that. You can do it by basically using algorithmic probability to make your prediction. So this unknown probability of your next bit, if you make many, many observations and record a lot of data, will just be very close to the algorithmic probability of the next bit, given, given your data. And so the solution to the robot's task is then just use algorithmic probability P for prediction. Now, what is algorithmic probability? So in a nutshell, it's basically the probability that a random computer program will output your string. So, for example, um, suppose you have seen bits that have been 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 all along. Yeah? Then it turns out that the algorithmic probability that your next bit is a zero will actually be small. So if you follow this prescription, you will predict that the next bit will probably also be a, zero, a one. Right? So in this sense, this is a measure that embodies some version of Occam's razor mm -hmm. uh, or of universal induction. So this is now my, my um, hypothesis here that there's a chance of your next state which is given by algorithmic probability. Now, suppose you make this assumption, you drop all assumption of a world. Now, what would that give you? First of all, it would be consistent with physics in the usual empirical regime. And that would be the case because according to some versions of the Church-Turing thesis, we just know that our world, as we know it, is a probabilistic environment that is computable. So it falls into the domain of Solomonov induction and then Solomonov induction will tell you that whatever you have as algorithmic probability of your next data, it will just, after you collected lots of data, really agree with the probabilities that your physical theories give you. So in some sense, this is consistent with physics as we, as we know it. Now, what if you're in this exotic regime and you say, oh, I'm now, you know, Alice the guinea pig. Will I actually be on Earth or on Mars? So what should I do? And the prescription here would be to say, well, to attach a probability that there's an actual chance of what happens to me, and to, to compute to say something about the chance, I would have to compare the compressibilities of the observer states that I would hold if I was on Earth or on Mars. So what, of the two options I have, I would just have to compare the compressibilities, and this would allow me to assign a probability of what happens next. And I say, good, okay, this is perhaps not very surprising. It's induction, and physics is also something like induction, so certainly consistent with physics in that sense. But why should we expect that there is some appearance of an external world in the first place? And then you can show something like the following. So you can say, well, let's go back to a moment before the agent has collected any information at the very beginning. And then it turns out that in the long run, as a prediction for what happens after you've collected many data, then there's a probability of at least two to the minus the complexity of well, some world W, that this world W will actually determine what you see. So what does that mean? So here are the actual algorithmic probabilities that I've you know, claimed determine what you see. And here is some other probability distribution. This probability distribution comes from some physical world, some um, computable process that's probabilistic. And in the long run, this process will actually be close to the probabilities that actually, um, that, that you will see. Whoops, sorry. Now, let me give you a picture, maybe it's easier. So here are your, your states. This is the data that you collect. This is now your observer state. And in the long run, it will just look as if it came from some simple computation. So there's this, the, the, the states, and there's also computation that generates the state. And what will that computation be? Well, it will be contingent, it will be random, but it will probably be a simple computation, meaning that the complexity of this thing here will be probably small. So whatever that is, it will probably have a very short program to run. Thank you. So does it mean 
Now you shouldn't think of a computation always like in, in this concrete way, like we think of our desktop computers or Turing machines. Computation is really just an abstract process. Yeah. It's an abstract computational process that generates what you see. And so this is the picture that perhaps is something like this. So here's your observer state, everything you see, everything you remember, all your available um, information, and it will just look as if it came from some larger process, which is a computation, which is probabilistic, and which is probably simple. Yeah. So um, certainly what this theorem does not tell you is what kind of process is that. Yeah? Certainly you cannot derive physics from it, but it will probably be a simple one. It will probably be one which has complex outcomes and will have started in a simple state because that's what computations tend to do. Um, now in the last part, um, just because I think it's the most fun part in the last four minutes, um, let me tell you what happens about more than one observer. Right now I've just talked about one observer and one observer seeing some kind of world around it. Um, now, but here's some question that you can ask if you have that. So I claim that you get some sort of emergent notion of objectivity. So think of this observer now, like Alice the guinea pig, yeah. Again, she's in some state. And as we've seen from the theorem before, which I had to rush a bit over, I apologize for that. Um, if the theorem applies, then things will pretty much look for Alice as if there was some kind of world around her. Yeah. Perhaps this is world we have to run around and collect points and so on. Yeah. Um, now, suppose in, in her world, in a world, she can just, there's just something else that she finds interesting. Like I in my world can point to this thing over there and say, oh, that's Scott. That's kind of an interesting piece of data. That would be like something like a bit string valued random variable. And what you can now ask in, in this context is you can ask, well, that other thing here, B, does it actually faithfully represent some first person perspective? So what would that mean here? So we could formalize it by comparing two probability distributions. There would be something like a third person probability. Third person probability will tell you how this thing B here changes over time according to the laws of A world. But there's also a first person probability to this thing, you can associate an observer state and the associated first person perspective. You can ask that actual thing, first person Bob, what happens to Bob? And that should be algorithmic probability as I've claimed. And a priori, this could be two different things. Um, so here's an example. Suppose every day in a world, the sun is rising. So Alice really has a 99% chance of seeing the sunrise tomorrow. Well, that means that Alice actually has a 99% chance of seeing Bob see the sunrise tomorrow. Yeah. So that would be the third person probability. But will Bob's actual chance of seeing the sunrise be 99%? Will it be the first person probability? And what you can show here is, as a theorem, okay, in the long run, these two will actually agree. So if Bob, that other thing here, contains enough data in some sense, then first and third person perspective will, will agree and give the same probabilities. However, certainly this only applies in the limit and only under some conditions. So what you get here automatically, and this is I think the fun part, uh, you get situations where first and third person probabilities are different. And examples would be actually Boltzmann brains. Yeah? Turns out that they would be, they would have this property and so this would be a probabilistic version of zombies. So nobody must be afraid that it's Boltzmann brain because Boltzmann brains are zombies. <laughs> that would be the take home message. But there are also other situations that we can think that uh, some sort of, of zombie is there. The, the Boltzmann brain problem, if, if you look at it in detail in this context, then um, it gets dissolved because what you would have to do is you would have to say that the data that's held by the Boltzmann brain is just very complex compared to the one that observes business as usual. So then this is why you would not expect to make the strange experience of a Boltzmann brain and that's how the problem is actually dissolved in this context. Okay, I should stop here. Um, so I've tried to show you that there are these conceptual puzzles that motivate some kind of unified approach to this question, what will I see next? Uh, this is really incomplete, so I, if you want I can tell you what's missing. But it shows you some, some kind of toy version how you could in a broadly idealist view, nevertheless have some notion of external world and understand why it's there, and also some notion of, of objective reality, which is nevertheless sometimes just breaking down. <laughs> okay, good. Um,
I apologize to everybody who tried to read my earlier version of my paper. That was 90 pages. It's now much shorter, so if you want to have a look, then I've updated two days ago. Okay, thanks very much for your attention.